Go for the ghost. Scared of me. I think that was it for the night, dear. Dunno. <laughs> I hope no, I hope so. Okay, well give us a shout if anything spooky happens to you. Let's have a word now. We've got Scott Jean and Phil to talk to. Let's have a word with Phil. No, we won't. We'll have a word with Jean first. Jean. Morning. Morning, Jean. Morning. I've got one very, very mild, actually. That doesn't <laughs> in matter. Comparison. Very, very mild in comparison. Oh, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it's where where I work. Uh, we used to have uh, an outer building, um, which is adjacent to the one that we're in now. And uh, when we first moved in there, it was um, like a cold, there was a cold feeling in there. And my boss had experienced something and hadn't said a word and apparently um, his sister came down as well and she saw this lady very very old lady in there and uh, he, he hadn't said a, a blind thing to me nothing and I'd got this feeling that there was a presence um, well, what sort of feeling was um, it? I just felt cold, very, very cold. Could, could you actually isolate a spot? Um, yes, it was it was in the adjacent room. And I said, I, I can't go in there. And he said, why? Well, see, this, this, is the, this is the one thing that confuses me. Well, not confuses me, but interests me about all this, is that if you can always sort of, it's like your body's got some sort of directional sense. Right. And you can sort of say, well, it's, I can say it's right there, you know, and I can tell exactly where it is. Mm. Yeah. And how did, did, did it make your, fle your flesh creep? Um, sort of? No, I, I just, I went cold and I, 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 I knew I couldn't go in there. And of course, I, I, I had to ask questions and apparently... Um, oh, you would have to ask, oh, I wouldn't have to, you? Yeah. Yes, I do. It does intrigue me very much. And apparently it was um, like an old uh, timekeeper's lodge. And he used to work very, very long hours and he... He used to keep a mistress, and uh, I think this is where uh, things used to manifest in there, you see. Well, now we're in... Saucy man. Yes, definitely. That's what I want for Christmas, <laughs> right A mistress. Not a, not a ghost, I'm quite happy No! <laughs> that sounds good. So, uh... Because <laughs> where we are now, um, you... We had to push the wall through to, to get... Um, a big machine through. We have thus sealed it up, and it was on Monday actually. I was working away in the adjacent room, and I didn't actually feel anything coming towards me. But all of a sudden, somebody touched my cheek, my hair. Th this was this the, week. Yes, it was this Monday, and my my I felt something go past my face. My hair on my right side flew up and my shoulder was pushed back You're and I just joking. said joking I said ow I think that was very restrained of you in the circumstances and the, the two circumstances. girls that were in there she says you felt it as well and I said yes what was it and she said well the other day she was sitting there and somebody touched her cheek and her hair went up on the right side and the other girl looked and saw something she didn't know what going out the door well i turned behind me and it seemed to go through the wall but what you actually saw something no i i felt something and it was like um uh you know like you see a shadow yeah i know like you see a shadow yes, and that was going literally back through the wall and the i mean uh Man, uh, no, it wasn't Monday, it was Tuesday. It was Tuesday, and we had those terrific um, showers. So, so you saw a shadow? Mm, I mean, there was no actual, it was real darkness outside, it was when it was hailing. And uh, I... It's pretty spooky, isn't it, seeing well, shadows? Well, it was, but all I said was to, uh, to David, then my, my boss, um, she has paid a visit, she's, you know, she's in here. And he shouts, yes, I know. <laughs> that blows, eh? So, um, but, uh, you know, quite, quite friendly, really. It's, it's, it was as though she was trying to tell me something. Yeah, definitely. And, and all this happened this week? Yes, it was this week. It was this Tuesday. And it's happened to the other girls as well? Oh, yes, um, weeks prior. Mm. 
It was your turn this week. Yes, it was. <laughs> well, I hope Andrew's taking comfort from all this, Andrew. <laughs> yes, we've also got a pub down in Ironbridge, um, the White Horse, and I have experienced something in there as well. I think we went past. Did we go past that today? Did you? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, what have you experienced in there? Um, it's, there was a. I was in there. I used to work, work there, and uh, there was a, an old gentleman, um, attired in, you know, like the um, uh, when they used to ride the coach and horses. Yeah. So they'd have the trench max and and he'd got one of those on and a big like a hat on his head. And he literally glided through the door, past this great big fireplace, and went up the steps. And you saw that? And I saw that, yes. And I, and I saw it through the copper canopy and turned and actually saw him walk through the door. And I just went, oh, <laughs> Mark! And she said, what? Because when I explained, she said, yes, you're not the first one to see it. Now this was, when was this? Oh, this... Uh, I'm going back, I've got to say, ten years. Has anybody seen him since? Uh, no, actually, not since. Because the people is... that are in there now, um, they they haven't seen a thing. But I know up, right, up, right in their top attic I could never go. It was icy cold. This sounds like a job for the Ghostbusters. Definitely, definitely. The White Horse in Ironbridge? Yes. OK, yes. I'll give them a call. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you would uh, would be intrigued. You know, as I say, there's, there's, a, there's a calming influence there now. But, th but then again, there's always been one. Um, but uh, who knows? Uh, just, just may. It may uh, spring back to life. Well, we'll see what we can do. Right. OK, then, thanks yeah, for that, Jean. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. There's Jean. Spooks coming out all over the place. Spooky, darling. Very, very spooky. I'm talking to Spooky. Andrew the Head of Cockups, if you just joined us, has been banished from the studio and into a part of Beacon Radio that is reputedly, if not haunted, well, some, certainly some very funny things go on there tonight. Oh, we've had the door locking itself. Mm -hmm. Andrew, mm -hmm. still seeing him too. So. Yeah, how, yeah, how, sorry, yeah. how are you now? Um... Actually, it's, um, it's gone very cool in here, uh, but not that uh, usual sort of chilling coldness. Yet. I think the air conditioning is cooling down a bit, that's all. You I hope. hope. I hope, yeah. yeah. It's very quiet, actually. I can hear the ticking of the clock. And I'm standing right by the door now. <laughs> I don't blame you. Just in case. I don't blame you. Okay, we'll check back with you in about ten minutes' time. You got any ghost stories? Call now. Call now. Let's speak to Scott. Scott. Morning. Hiya, Scott. Love the new jingle. <laughs> yes. Spooky, isn't it? Weird. Well, spooky, spooky darling. Well, spooky. Right. The story I've got happened about seven years ago when I was 13. Right. And where I used to live in Charlesley Wood which by the airport, there was this house, well, the house is in Toll Cross. Now, me and some of my mates decided to go and see whether this place was really haunted, like we heard. And <laughs> Bright move, Scott. Well, yeah, we were kind of loopy. That's what I've always been. Uh, this house had supposedly been deserted for about, like, 20, 30 years by the time we went up there. And we were still at the top of the drive, there was about a 100-yard drive, and as we were looking down, we could see this shadow in one of the windows. Yeah. Now, my other two mates were a bit nervous about it and thought, no, we should go. But me and my other mate decided we should go and investigate. So we trundled off down the path, managed to get into the house, and went up to this room where we saw the shadow. Right. Where our other two mates were keeping look out all the time. Even brighter. Well, yeah, I was an intelligent kid. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> well, Let's see, we'll go down the haunted churchyard and have a picnic at midnight. Well, you've got to do something to excite yourself, well find out fun. So we walked into this room where we saw the shadow and walked up to the window and we could see our other mates stood at the top of the driveway but we couldn't see nothing in the room. Right. Now... <laughs> the other cockles has just gone for a cup of tea, I can hear him. <laughs> 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 Sorry, go on. Now, this house, like I said, had been deserted for 20, 30 years but there was still things in there like that you wouldn't expect. Like there's an old TV set in there and an old wireless which didn't work because we did try them, we wanted to see what was on telly and the radio. And 
we carried on looking around the rest of the house. Now, as we were walking up the stairs to the top floor, we heard footsteps behind us. So, being in our intelligent selves, we turned around and couldn't see nothing. At that point, we ran out. And when yeah, we got isn't mass hysteria a marvellous thing? <laughs> when we got back to about, about two hours of the at the top of the drive, we asked them if they saw us in the window. They said they saw us, and the shadow that they saw is a grey coloured shadow had been there all the time, although we didn't see anything. Tell you, mate, what, what do you make of that then? I don't know. It was just an old deserted house that had a reputation for being haunted. Well, other people said it had been haunted. I didn't believe it at the time. I still don't believe it was. I think it was about imagination being I agree with you. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of the time, especially if you're with a group of people, your imagination can absolutely run riot. I mean, we did. We, we did exactly the same as you did when we were about 13. It was me, Terry Givens, and Stephen White. And, uh, it was from some hell's there we up to soon. Um, and we all went to this, this deserted building in the middle of the country that was known to all the kids around the place as the Mushroom Factory. Right? And it ended with the three <laughs> it was absolutely, it was a really funny night because we only had one match left <clears throat> and it was blowing a gale <laughs> we started off with about 20 matches left you know and uh, fight one of your mates well yeah yeah I mean, uh, well, yes I didn't have to develop my violent tendencies so I was a bit older and we, we sort of crouched behind um <laughs> <laughs> we crashed behind this uh, hedge on a light, these cigarettes, and in the end we only had one match left, so we decided to... You decided to be too young for smoke then. Well, I was about, yes, yes, you're absolutely right, I was a bad lad, and I'm paying for it now. And, uh, anyway, we went off into the mushroom factory, and we decided that we were going to light the cigarette in there, so we got in this mushroom factory, lit the cigarette, and then mass hysteria took over. That's all I can call it, I didn't see anything, I think the other two guys did, and before we know where we were, Stephen White had left it out, tripped and landed full... F- <laughs> just gone diving into a cow pit. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. I'll never forget him singing a he was singing a chorus of Oh Den Golden Slippers or something, the old Al Jolson song. And uh, nobody go anywhere near him because he stank. So but I mean that was just hysteria. I mean we went back telling tales of of terror about the the ghost in the mushroom factory. Well, nobody actually saw it. It was just hysteria, and I, I think you, you've got to differentiate. Having said that, it doesn't it doesn't explain when somebody sort of stood there on their own and they see a figure glide past? I, mean, I don't know what that is. I never actually seen a figure, but we saw this like grey shadow thing, like I said, in the window. And I've still got friends who live over there now, and their younger brothers they do the same as we did, and they go over there trying to see if they can see anything. And what is it about being young that makes you do nutty things like that? Okie dokie, mate. Okay. Thanks for that. Bye. Cheers. Um, let's have a look. Let's see how the Edda Cockups is doing. Edda Cockups. I've just had a very nice number six, thank you. I'm just on my way back. Off the tea machine. Yeah. You were having a tea break, were you? <laughs> I wasn't stopping in there any longer on my own. Okie dokie, off you go. Go back into the haunted bit of the building. Uh, who have we got now? Phil. Let's speak to Phil. Phil. Hello, Ian. Hello, Phil. Boo. Boo. <laughs> Don't go staying that to the other <laughs> cockles. This, this, uh, this story I'm going to tell you now is very, very true. Right. It involves a friend of mine who lives in Coventry. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and a couple of weeks ago he visited his parents who moved to Norfolk. Anyhow, and after they'd moved to Norfolk, his, his grandmother was moaning that she was low. And, uh, anyhow, and he went down to visit his mum and dad, and there was he and his brother. And, uh, they got to the house, and the, his mum and dad said there wasn't any room because their gran was going to stop with them, because she wouldn't stop in the cottage on her own, because it was haunted. And they said, well, this is silly, you know, it's your imagination, so we'll stop there tonight, and we'll prove to you there's nothing wrong with it. Anyhow, so they went down the pub. Which has got nothing to do with it, by the way. Oh, good, right. And, and they had a couple of drinks. You just set in the, the atmosphere. Set in the right. scene. And, uh, and they had a couple of drinks. They went back to the uh, to his parents' house and uh, had a coffee. And then they walked across the field to the cottage. And, yeah, they watched a bit of television and they, uh, and they went to bed. And at two o'clock in the morning, I could hear this talking, and he said it was just as if someone was talking, and, and you were listening with your fingers in your ears. It was muffled. Right. And there was these muffled voices, and there was two different voices. And then I could hear the furniture scraping across the floor. Probably and being robbed by gay burglars, <laughs> probably in rearranging the furniture. <laughs> and the furniture was being moved across the floor. So he woke his brother up, and he said, here, listen to this. And he says, they're having a son. They're pulling our leg. 
And they looked out the window, and there was no car there. They could have come right around the lane to the house, and there was no car on the drive. He said, I've walked across the field. He said, and they're trying to frighten us. Anyway, so they both crept down the stairs to open the door and shout, boo, to frighten the hell out of them. And they crept down the stairs. When they opened the, the door, the lights were out, and there was nobody there. They put the lights on, and everything was in position. Nothing had moved. Nothing at all had moved. Now I said, now, said, now was it the drink or what? And he said, no, he said, all we had was a couple of pints. We had arrived there late. He said, we hadn't really got time to do much else. When I sorted myself, uh, sorted myself out at this uh, cottage, I was back the case and whatever. You, you would actually be amazed <coughs> to realise how many people are now sitting there, or lying there in bed, <laughs> thinking, Oh God, that was the settee downstairs moving. <laughs> it's right, that is. Did, but, any, did anything else happen to them, or was that just an well, isolated... Well, well, so they had, the, they had the furniture moving, and they had these muffled, and there was two voices. There was a conversation which they couldn't make out, going on between two people. And he said it was just as if you'd got your fingers in your ears, it was muffled. And they just legged it, and they legged it across the field. And the, the parents' house was all locked up, they were in bed, and they had to knock them up. And they said, that's it. Anyhow, uh, after that, they were there for the week, and after that they went to the, the agent who sold the house. And this house had been, it had been empty for a few months, like. And, uh, and he said that when he was showing people around, he thought there was something wrong with the place. But obviously he wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a bunch of state agents. But it's re really weird, and, and, and this lad, he hasn't got a vivid imagination. There definitely was something there, he tells me. A conversation on moving furniture. Yeah. And there's, there's another one. Um, one, of me, one of my brothers has just been down to London to have a look at a, a, a job in, in London that we're working on. And it's Pearl Assurance Offices. Yeah. And it's a Victorian building. And apparently years ago, it was like big corridors with all little cubicles off the, cor off the corridor where people used to go and did, you know, discuss their business in private. And, uh, and the night watchman was telling him that on a bench seat, in, in the in the um, in the corridor, there sits a Victorian lady in black in black dresses, and he says, and she sits there with with her hands in her lap, and she doesn't move at all until somebody walks down the corridor, and she moves the skirts out the way. How weird! And he says, come off it. He says, no way. And the, anyway, he showed him um, he showed him this um, magazine that that that, that printed. The history of Pearl Assurance, and in and in this magazine, it shows you picture, photographs of the building actually being built all those years ago, and they're, re, they're refurbishing this building, but they're actually going to leave this corridor as it is. And they said, no end of lots of people have seen this lady, and they, they don't want to touch it, they don't want to frighten her away, they want to leave it as it is. That's a sort of conversation piece. That's right, yeah. Well, it beats having a Rottweiler, doesn't it? Well, and talking of, I don't know if you remember, but I spoke to you one night off air. Yes, I do, yes. Yeah. And I told you that my me, uh, me brother's got a house that's haunted. Right? Yeah. And just at the back of the house there stands a monastery, um, which was built in 1623. And for the first fortnight after he moved in, he's got two Rottweilers. And for the first fortnight, these dogs did nothing but hell. Every night. Had you forgotten to unpack them or something? <laughs> Every night they did nothing but hell. And they keep looking towards the monastery. And they still do now. They don't take as so much notice as they did. But they still show a lot of interest in the place. And they sit there looking at it for ages. Makes you wonder what they can see that humans can't, doesn't well, it? Well, this is, this is right, yeah. This is right. I'm reasonably convinced it's something. Okay, Phil, thanks for that. I've got to move on. Uh, first of all, we've got Jeff and we've got Kev to speak to. Uh, Andy, yeah, how's it going? Well, if there was anything up here earlier on, I really do think it's gone because it's there's, there's nothing up here tonight. Very quiet. Very quiet. It's probably down here with me. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Hope so. Ha 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 ha. Take a ride. Okay, I'll keep. Uh, I'll keep. Uh, I'll keep. Uh, hold on. Hold on. We got something. Yeah. Um, I think it's about to tell me what places actually. Why? Have you set up some sort of practical? Oh, no, 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 no. It's just that. Uh, the idea was that you did the program from up here. Yeah, it's funny how that turned um, out, isn't it? Um, you've got out of it again. Yes, well, never mind, Andrew. I'm sure you'll be all right for another ten minutes. Let's have a word with, uh, who have we got here? We've got Kev on seven. Kev. Ken. Ken. Ken, 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 Ken. Ken. Sorry, Ken. 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 
Good evening, morning, Ken. Guys, Happy Halloween, Ken. Good morning. Uh, my story doesn't actually concern me. It concerns my sister. Now, years ago, uh, all the girls went off into the land army, as you very well know. Yeah, well, I wasn't actually in it. No, but you remember the stories. Yes. Right? Now, my mm. sister was stationed at a place called St. Asaf, which is about 20 oh, miles yeah. outside Rilk. Yeah. By the, uh, there's, there's a big marble church That's there. correct, yeah, the marble church by there, yeah. Did you know there's a lot of war graves in that cemetery? Oh, yes, I do, yes. And what I didn't, I, I mean, I tried to read the translation, they're actually Polish war graves. That's right, And yeah. they were shot by the British. Uh, there was an uprising or something. Ooh, I, yeah. I didn't know it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. This story was used to be told to us when we were kids around the old uh, coal fire on the winter nights, you know. We had no tellies, no radios, nothing in them days, you know what I mean? Just used to all sit around the piano wishing that somebody That's knew right. how to play it. Play it, yeah, yes. exactly. So, the story goes that while they were stationed there, there was about six, perhaps eight, girls of uh, 16 to 18 year old working on this farm, doing the bit log for the war effort, yeah? Yeah. Right. Now, at night, they all, six of them slept in a, like a big dormitory. Six of the girls all slept in the same dormitory. And this one night that it started, they heard this music. Now, the music turned out to be the Blue Danube. Yeah? Yeah. Now, if, if I told you this story once, you'd say we're a load of rubbish. But this was told to me time and time again, year after year, in exactly the same way. So, I tend to believe it, yeah? All okay. Right. So, the next morning at breakfast, uh, they said to the, the farmer and his wife, like, where's the radio? Thinking we could borrow it to listen to some music. And he said, radio? We've got no radio here. I've never had one, like. See? So I thought nothing was thought more about it at the time. So the next night, or two nights later, whatever it may be, they were lying in bed again, about ten o'clock, all lights out for the lights out for the war light. And this music started again. Organ playing the Blue Danube, exactly the same. So they all said, can you hear it? Yeah, I can hear it. Can you? Yeah, I can hear it. I mean, they all agreed it was there. So the next morning at breakfast, they asked again, who's got the radio? No, we ain't got one. Well, who's, who's got an organ? Who plays an organ? No, I don't know anybody. Who's, who's hiding the orchestra in their kit bag? That's it, that sort of thing. Anyway, they narrowed it down to the church. Now, whether it would be the marble church or another church, I do not know. Possibly another one. I think I'll fancy finding out. Anyway, they decided, being girls, that if it happens again, they was going to go and find out who was playing this organ, you see. There's always one, isn't there? Yeah, well, my sister's always been like that. She's always a forefront to like, you know what I mean? Right. So anyway, they meet better this next night, or two nights later, at ten o'clock, and it started again. So they said, right, this is it. So they all get out of bed in the dramas and the nighties, and they put the coats on and the overalls on, what they used to wear. And they creeped down the stairs and out the farmhouse door, right? So remember, in it's pitch black dark, they're in the middle of nowhere, it's all farmland, yeah? Yeah. So I'm all holding hands, like, down the country line towards this church, and they can still hear this music coming from the church. So they get down through the gates, or whatever it may be, up to the church door, and as soon as they got by the church door, it stopped. So they turned around and fled. Quite understandably, in my opinion. <laughs> and that is the story. Well, did they ever find out what it was? No, no, but it, it happened again and again, but they, they wouldn't go back no more. A damn awful taste <laughs> of music, that ghost. They wouldn't go back no more. Oh, no. I wonder if it did requests. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>